And for those of you online, um, I can see the chat. So just toss something in the chat. I'll be able to see it if you have any questions. All right, well, welcome to, this is halfway, halfway through the semester, which is kind of crazy. Um, so it's kind of exciting because now this is the point in the semester where we know enough stuff that we can do more fun things. Um, at least I think so, right? The, I mean, not that the stuff that we have done so far is not fun, but um, we get to take like a little bit bigger picture at, um, at systems and thermodynamics and how we can use it to think about things, which I think is, you know, that's the more fun part. Um, we'll do that a little bit today. Before we jump into that though, I wanna make sure, because otherwise I'll talk too long, I wanna make sure we have time to talk about what the exam is gonna be like. Um, I'm sure you all care more about that right now than most anything else that I can say, right? So, so we'll jump into, I, I guess here at the start, um, a little bit what the exam is like and then um, the last part of the class will be um, I think kind of kind of interesting at least it's interesting to me um, okay so if you go to Moodle you'll find week seven um, there's no participation this week there's no homework this week there's a whole bunch of um, there's some new asynchronous videos and then a whole bunch of exam study material um, type stuff. So hopefully you get a chance to really dig into that um, and have some some specific time that you can set aside for that. There's a couple um, things that I want to draw your attention to. So we'll talk these first. Okay, so they're kind of a set of three videos. We're going to talk really briefly um, after I'm done with this about what those videos are. Um, then there's a um, Video four is a, a solved example problem. Um, and I go through and solve it. It's actually, it's like the video is two parts because I don't know, my screen capture stuff was freaking out. So I recorded like an hour long video and it screwed up the audio track. So I had to go and record it again and it stopped me halfway. So then I like recorded it in two parts and I didn't splice them together. So. It's, it's pretty long. It's like an hour with the two parts. It's maybe a little more than an hour even with the two parts um, combined. But what I do is I try to go through and explain um, the process that I'm thinking about these problems. It's a fairly complicated problem. Um, it's a thermodynamic cycle problem, but you have to do mass balances in there and it gets, it gets fairly complicated. Um, but hopefully that's a way that you can see um, in a complicated problem, we still solve the systems by the same process, the same steps. Um, we can think about right, going, going around the cycle in the same way. So hopefully that's, uh, if you feel good about that example, um, you're, you've done a good job studying for the exam, um, at least on that part. So, uh, so that's, I think, a really good example problem. There's a second example problem that I didn't make a video for that I just have the solution for, but those two example problems together, if you feel good about those, you're in a pretty good spot. Um, to just go, and I guess before I talk too much more about that, at the bottom there is the exam study guide. So let's talk a little bit about what the exam is gonna be like. Um, so, on the exam itself, we are going to be finding um, entropy and enthalpy and specific volume and all of these values. Um, we're going to be finding them with our steam tables. Um, and that is in part because CAT3 is a little bit flaky. Um, right, you maybe have run into that where all of a sudden it gives just bonkers answers and stops working. Um, it's also because not all of us have access to CAT3 on a laptop um, where we could use that in class. So we'll be doing it with this, we'll be solving the problems with the steam tables. Um, now, a note on that, um, looking up values in the steam tables is, right, part of engineering, um, you will find this in your career, is being able to read tables and charts and graphs and get the right numbers from big tables. So that's a that's a skill that you will use in your career. So I like I don't want to totally throw that aside. Um, 
but making a mistake reading off the wrong value on the steam table is not like that's not the highest level of thermodynamics um so i i understand that if you read the wrong value that's a relative that's a minor error um if instead of an energy balance you go and do something that's not an energy balance at all that's obviously like a bigger conceptual error um so don't worry too much about like I guess while you're taking the exam, if you know what you're trying to find and like you're crunched for time and you're nervous and you just can't find it, like I need to find the enthalpy at this temperature and at this entropy and I have, I can't find it, just write down a number and say, I couldn't find this, let's call it 400 or something like that. If you can write down something reasonable, say maybe it's this or you write down the wrong value, but you say, this is what I'm looking for. Um, that's going to go a long way in getting you partial credit. And if you continue on and do everything else right, that's just going to be a really minor mistake. Um, so don't fret too much about, um, I mean, practice reading the steam tables. Make sure that you have that down. Hopefully, we all do at this point. Um, but just know when you're taking the exam, that's not the biggest thing I'm testing you on. So if you get tripped up on that, come and ask me, right? Like, we, you can ask me during the exam. I'm looking for this, I can't find it. Um, you know, at the very least, I could say, I'll give you a number and like make a comment on your exam and we'll take off, you know, a few points for that, but I'll give you a number so that you can kind of continue on. Um, so don't let reading steam tables be the, the end of your, um, of your exam. Um, it's part of it. It's an important part of it because, as I said, it's, it will be part of your engineering career is reading charts and tables and graphs and being able to, to figure out values from those. Um, okay. Bring, if you have one still, most of you should, bring the printout of it just because it's easy to flip through. Um, the other thing that you should bring to the exam, obviously, is a calculator. We're going to be doing calculations. Um, I, I will bring extra steam tables. I will bring my one calculator in case like one person runs out of battery, but that's all that I can do. Um, the other thing to bring, and I, I kind of hesitate like whether to make the, the exam just open notes or to do a note sheet. I think it's easier to do, um, it's a better study tool and it will be better for you as an, on the exam to have it be, um, but one, like, I don't want you to just like, here's a solution that I already did or that, you know, Dr. Christians did and posted on Moodle. Let me just write it down. I don't think that's um, very helpful. So I want you to actually go through the problem solving process. Um, but also, I think it's it helps kind of it helps you compile stuff and get stuff kind of organized in your mind if you make a note sheet. Um, I have written here that you should have one like normal piece of paper handwritten on one side. Um, I will say, and I'm being recorded, so I have to stick to this. I don't care too much about exactly what that looks like. So if you said, man, I really need that second side of the paper, I don't really care. Um, I think you can fit everything that you need to know for this on one side of a page without writing in like, you know, magnifying glass font. Um, everything that I would put on my note sheet, I could fit on one side. Um, but if you really feel like, you know, I've, it's getting way too crammed, I'm writing way too small, um, I don't really care if you use two sides. Um, one of the reasons I write this is because on the final exam, we're going to have a note sheet like this as well. So if you make a one-sided note sheet and keep it, you can flip it over and write notes on for the final exam, and then you have right, everything that we've done in the class on both sides of your page. So it will save you work in the future if you do one side. Um, I'm not super picky about that. Um, anyway, so that's my, again, I have it written down. I'm not gonna come and like collect your note sheet and if you wrote on the second side minus 100, like I'm not gonna do that. Um, okay, so the format of the exam, um, what am I doing? Over here, wrong computer. Um, the format of the exam, it's going to be kind of two parts, right? It's 
25% of our grade, so it's 250 points, which sounds like a lot of points. Um, I guess it is a lot of points. Um, I, uh, the first part of the exam is going to be um, a couple questions that are, should feel a little bit like um, quiz questions, like multiple choice or really short answer or, you know, like the calculations that we had to do in the last quiz where it's like, I plugged in, I wrote one equation and plugged in like two numbers on my calculator, those kind of calculations. So there might be a calculation, but it will be that type. Um, and it will cover, it's kind of like the grab bag, um, where I'm going to try to cover topics that I, are not covered in part two. Um, so these are the topics, right, things that we've done in class, um, definitions of the first law, first and second law, um, maybe something about the Carnot cycle, um, maybe something about how do we make good assumptions for the energy balance um, in more complicated cases, because we're going to, in the actual um, steam cycle problem, um, that's not going to be a big part of that. So maybe I could ask something like that. Um, maybe something like isentropic efficiency. Um, anyway, so you can you can read the bullet points there, but it's going to be basic. It's the goal of that is to be like the grab bag for um, topics that are not covered or not covered as heavily in the second section. And the second section is really where um, I guess the meat of the exam is. And um, the second section is going to be a steam power plant cycle of some kind. You have now solved a number of steam power plant cycles. You've solved in detail a couple Carnot cycles. You've solved in detail a couple, uh, you've solved ranking cycles now in detail. Um, so you've gone through and solved a couple of these steam cycle problems, a number of these steam cycle problems. It's gonna be one of those. Um, it's not going to be exactly like the ones that you have solved, but um, right, you've solved, for example, you've solved a steam cycle problem where it was kind of like a ranking cycle, but now one of the turbines was not 100% efficient. It was like 70% efficient. Um, so there can be modification. There are going to be modifications to it. It's not going to be just like the basic ranking cycle that's uh, relatively easy. There's going to be some sort of modification where we bring in some of the other stuff that we've done in the class. Um, so it'll feel a little bit like. Right. And I, I like these problems because it really does force you to take all of the stuff that we've done in the class, like things like um, right, energy balances, which we're never going to get away from. Um, things like the second law. How do we use that? How do we use entropy? How do we deal with efficiency and real pieces of equipment versus ideal? One? How do we bring all of this stuff together? How do we deal with mass balances if we have a turbine with two outlets? Um, so how do we deal with all of these kind of different things that we've touched on in um, in various ways throughout the course and and bring those together now um, i will make the disclaimer and some of you um will will see this on the uh on one of the example problems that i have make the disclaimer that the book um and maybe you found this in the homework doesn't always describe things completely and it may feel like you have to like make up a value for something. Maybe you felt that way. Um, that's because the right the book is kind of operating on a, a set of assumptions as to like what makes a ranking cycle. Um, and I'm I don't want to test you on like do you know all of that? I want to test you on can we like work through logically a big hairy cycle problem like this. Uh, so this, the example problem that I have for like what this steam cycle would be, um, expect it's one problem, it's 200 points, but it's not going to be just one problem. Okay. It's going to be a problem with multiple parts. It will have, I assure you more parts than what this problem has, um, right. It might give you like the first step is, you know, what's the outlet of the turbine, like solve the turbine. And that's just like a single piece of equipment. And then maybe it asks you for one other piece and then another piece. So it's going to ask you for a couple a couple parts. Um, so don't think it's like 200 points, yes or no, all on what your final answer is. Um, I promise you that there will be, a, it will ask you for a thermal efficiency of the cycle. Um, 
and it will ask you for a number of different components and those could change, but a number of different pieces along the way. The format of this question, like how it's written here, will be really similar to how the final exam question is written. Uh, this is how I'm gonna write it. I'm gonna take this, like this will be my template. Um, right, so, so you can see here, I'm trying to be a little bit more um, clear than how our book problems typically are written. Um, in terms of uh, what exactly is happening, like whether it's exiting as a saturated liquid or not a saturated liquid, um, what the temperatures and pressures are that to make sure that like if the pressure coming into the boiler is something, the pressure leaving the boiler is that same thing, I'll just say that explicitly. Um, so, but this should be kind of a, a good template for you as to what the question should, what the question will look like. Okay. Um, yeah, and here I have, um, I'm having you calculate two different parts. Um, just know the, the actual exam question will probably be more part, maybe two or three or four, or maybe even five different parts, but it'll be basically like this. And if you can figure your way out around the cycle for this, you'll have all of the information that you would need to, to do all of the different parts that um, would be asked. Questions? Yeah, Ellie. Can we have like the full two hour class period to it? Yes, so Ellie's question was time. Um, and yes, we will have, so we'll be meeting in class. Um, if you need special accommodation for outside of class or something like that, just shoot me an email and we'll figure that out. But yes, we will have a two hour time block um, for the exam. Any other questions? Good. Okay. All right, so hopefully with the some of the study stuff that I have, um, hopefully you'll find, uh, at least when you come to the exam that, right, the questions are not a surprise. Right? You know, basically the whole exam is gonna be a steam cycle. So if there are questions about how do you approach these, how do you tackle these, um, right, the next week is a good time to, to wrestle with some of those questions. Okay. So we'll start here. Um, and I just want to touch on this a little bit. Um, so we go over, I go over in the kind of the first three, um, parts it's really only they're all really short they're all um i think one is five minutes one is eight minutes like they're just they're just really short videos um i go over some different modifications to the ranking cycle and i would just want to talk briefly about that now um and to give a little bit of background as to why we would even want to modify the ranking cycle and then we'll talk a little bit more about real world systems. Um, so I think the easiest way to like conceptualize, or at least to not to conceptualize, but to visualize um, what we're going for when we're modifying the ranking cycle is to look at the temperature entropy diagram. And that's why we've drawn these a lot lately. Right over here on one side, we have Carnot. Temperature entropy, Carnot is the best. Right? It's the best possible and it looks like this. Right, it's our square. We have these four states over here. Um, so that's the picture in your mind on the temperature entropy diagram, at least for what the best is. Um, ranking, the normal ranking cycle. Um, 
right? Which is also an idealized cycle. Um, it's just like uh, idealized over, I guess, kind of a real, um, what we could really approach to do. On a temperature entropy diagram, right? It looks like we'll put the, um, the phase diagram on there. I'll do this in blue so we can see it. It looks like this, right? So it's got this little kind of doohickey on the on the one side, um, and right, it solved some problems that we had with Carnot. Um, what we're going to do in, in these three videos is talk about three different ways that we now solve problems that we have with ranking. Um, one of them is just kind of a, a fundamental problem. Uh, so the first video, we're going to be looking at what's coming out of the condenser right there. Uh, and right, essentially what's happening is we have a in, in a ranking cycle, that's a saturated liquid. It's a liquid exactly at the boiling point. And the reason that we did that was because we could then feed a liquid into a pump. And that worked great. Uh, it does work great. The problem is that if we have any real fluctuations in our system, um, right, instead of being, I'll zoom in on this, right, instead of being right there, maybe you have a fluctuation and your cooling water isn't quite as cold as it should be right there's something out you're getting your cooling water from a, a lake and it's been warm and now the cooling water temperature has gone up then maybe you end up right there and you're back in the same situation that we were before right you have normal changes in your process that screw you up and now right we were trying to get 100 percent liquid and now we don't have 100 percent liquid we have a little bit of vapor and everything messes up again and your whole system shuts down. So in practice, real systems don't have saturated liquids. Um, they have what we call subcooled liquids. So we take it and we cool it a little bit more than we would need to. Um, so that's one modification that we make just for kind of like practical purposes. Um, and we'll draw out the, the temperature entropy diagram um, in these videos. The other two modifications that we make um, are to make, right, we have this um, goofy looking temperature entropy diagram. What we want it to be is closer to a square. Uh, so you can look at that and say, okay, where are the parts that are not square? Um, one way to make it more square would be if we, um, and this is on the, uh, on the participation for this week. So if you've, if you've looked at that, you've at least seen this before. One way is to raise the pressure in the boiler. What that would do is we would go then up to say here, and it would look something like that. And you can see we kind of like shrunk how big our little swoop was, a little like Nike swoosh. Um, so this is higher pressure in our boiler. Um, so again, you can go through and, and go back through your uh, one of your solutions to the ranking cycle and see how changing that pressure would actually affect things. Um, it basically only does good things. Um, it decreases the... Um, amount of heat that you have to put into the boiler. So it decreases QH and it increases the work from your turbine and it increases the work of your pump, but only a teeny tiny bit. And that was small anyway. So in effect, the, the net effect is that your thermal efficiency goes up. You get right on a TS diagram, you get more square, right? You kind of squared it off a little bit. So you would get a better, uh, a better efficiency. Uh, the the other two modifications that we'll talk about in these videos, um, go through and look at right where the other parts that are not square. Well, one is this left-hand side here. Um, so we'll talk about what does it take to make that more square? 
Um, the other side part is, what about this uh, right hand side? Can we do something to like, you know, take down that little swoop even more? Um, it, it turns out for both of those, the answer is yes, that we can. Um, and um, we do in real systems. So we make modifications to kind of both sides of the temperature entropy diagram um, in different ways to kind of square up that um, temperature entropy diagram so that we don't have as big of a swoosh on the one side and that the left side, right, where it kind of slants in, that that um, kind of goes up and is a little bit more squared off. Okay. No matter what um, system we're looking at, though, the process that you're solving it is exactly the same. Um, so you'll see that when we go and uh, solve, we'll solve a ranking cycle um, where we do both of these things in the example problems for the exam. Um, where we kind of do something to, to work on the left side and we one where we do something to work on the right side. And we'll see um, the actual solution process is exactly the same as solutions that we've done for our homework. We're just kind of putting things together from, from different parts of the class. So you already know how to do this. The... Um, The general steps the general steps that I use for solving a cycle problem like this, um, these four steps, and I would put these steps on your, this would be on my cheat sheet. Uh, because these are the steps that you're going to, like, I promise you that you will do these steps and that doing these steps in order will help you just like get started on the problem and know how to attack it. Um, the first step and probably the most important is to take kind of the text of the problem and translate it into a picture. Um, so it might help to have some right to go over how do we actually do that. Um, and there are some some opportunities to do that both in the homework and in some of the exam study materials. How do you take kind of this text and draw a, one of these block diagrams, one of these pictures that we've been using. Uh, draw a good picture, label all the streams, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, however many there happen to be. Um, then the second step is to go back through the problem. So that should be the first step is you're not trying to fill out like temperatures and pressures and stuff. You're just trying to say, okay, it goes from a boiler into a turbine and then back in, and like, how do I go around the circle? Um, draw a picture. The second step is to then take, like, go back through the problem statement, and then you're starting to fill out the information that you're given and putting it onto your scheme so that you have all of the given information and that you can kind of just work with that picture. Um, then in step three, you're trying to figure out where to start. Um, there are, right, you have to start, I have here, start where you know everything. Right. What that means is you have to know if you know two independent pieces of information, you can look up the rest. And that's what I'm talking about. There might be only a single point on the cycle where you know that um, there might be three points. It doesn't matter how many there are. You just have to pick one. Uh, and then your your last step is then to think um, energy balance. Right. So we're going to be moving around the cycle doing energy balance, energy balance, energy balance, energy balance. So we're going to do an energy balance from two to three, then from three to four, then from four to five. If we get stuck, go around the other way and go from, right, you can go either way around it. Um, so if you get stuck going one way, try to turn around and go backwards the other way. If you still get stuck, maybe you chose a starting, maybe you can choose a different starting point if there is another one. Um, but you're always thinking like moving around energy balance, energy balance, energy balance around the cycle. So you're really typically, uh, unless you're asked something specifically about it, you're thinking like, I need to find the enthalpy, H. What's H1? What's H2? What's H3? Uh, and that's typically what you're going for as you're moving around the cycle. Okay. Um, each of those individual energy balances might change a little bit depending on, um, right? They, it might be 
super easy. It might be like one line in your solution. It might be a relatively, you know, it might be a half a page to do that energy balance, right? There are different levels of complication, right? It could be an energy balance on a real turbine, or it could be just a really simple energy balance where you're given most of the information and you just write down what the answer is. So that's step four is going to change, but um, that's what you're thinking is I'm, how do I do an energy balance from, you know, the point that I'm at to the next point around the cycle. Okay. So we're now, I want to shift with the last 20 minutes or so, just shift gears a little bit um, and talk about some real systems. Um, so what we've found so far, hopefully you've uh, you've seen this and, and questioned it at least a little bit, right? We have um, a cycle like this. We've kind of been focused on what's inside of this black box with my little circle around it, what's inside the cycle. Uh, but essentially what we have happening is we have heat going in, heat leaving, um, a waste heat, and we have work coming out. Uh, for most um, thermodynamics, most power cycles like this, our cold reservoir is the ambient environment. Um, almost all the time, our cold temperature is going to be the ambient environment. Uh, so that's usually kind of a fixed temperature. There's not much that we can do about it. There's some stuff that maybe we design specifically to keep that as cold as possible. Um, things like cooling towers, which maybe you've seen on both the Holland power plant or like if you've seen pictures of a nuclear power plant and there are the big stacks with, you know, quote unquote smoke coming out the top. That's not smoke coming out the top, that's just water. Um, and those big, those whole big stacks are designed just to keep their, um, their cold temperature as cold as possible. The hot temperature comes from burning fossil fuels often. It doesn't have to, it can come from, uh, right, we've seen, it can come from geothermal power, it can come from um, concentrated solar power. It most often um, comes from burning fossil fuels. Does anybody have a, an idea, what are the kind of range of temperatures that we've, that I've given you for homework problems for the hot temperature? 400 degrees Celsius. Maybe we've done like 450, 500 Celsius, things thereabouts. Um, does anybody know what temperature do different fossil fuels burn at? If I were to burn coal, what temperature is that? A lot higher. Is it? Or is it like five or 600 degrees? Anybody know? Between like one to two thousand Celsius. So here are some combustion temperatures for um, for different fossil fuels. Coal, about twenty two hundred Celsius. Oil, about twenty one fifty Celsius. Um, natural gas, about two thousand degrees Celsius. So we've already talked about this a little bit, right? Um, and we know from Carnot, if we can get a, our cold temperature colder, that's better. If we can get our hot temperature hotter, that's better. Um, our cold temperature is kind of stuck, stuck at ambient temperatures. But our hot temperature, why aren't we using 2,000 degrees? Is it just because I gave you bad example problems? Yeah, William. Uh, is it because at those temperatures there's no vapor liquid transition phase? It just goes straight from being a liquid to a vapor? So that's um, the answer was because there's no vapor liquid transition. So that's part of it, a little bit, but not exactly. Um, so we kind of could theoretically use really high temperatures. Um, what we find though is um, things tend to blow up, right? So we're making these out of real materials. Um, what's the melting point of steel? 
Anybody know? Ballpark? More or less than 2,000 degrees. It's lower. Have you ever put, like, when you're roasting marshmallows, put your marshmallow fork in the fire and it, it turns red hot and you can bend it? Um, so when that starts happening to things, that's obviously bad. Um, so we can't use temperatures that high because we start melting our equipment and, okay, so we can't use 2,000 degrees. We also can't use infinitely high pressures, right, because the higher the pressure, the more problems we're going to have with any material issues that we have. So this is, um, you probably didn't know that this existed, the National Board of Boiler and Pressure, pressure Vessel Inspectors. Um, this is a, a thing. And they track accidents that are happening in, um, in power plants, right? We're using stuff, I mean, you think about even the example problems that I've given you, 500 degrees Celsius, you may not think of that as super hot, that's really hot. Right, think of what that is, like your oven, when you turn it on at 400, that's pretty hot. That's 400 degrees Fahrenheit. 500 Celsius, 600 Celsius is really, really hot. Um, five megapascals, 10 megapascals, we're talking about really high pressures. So we have some stuff that's really hot, really high pressure, that's an explosion hazard. So that's what's limiting us kind of on the top end of of a lot of these systems is we're dealing with just explosion hazards. Um, so in, right, especially early on, like right, we've, we've become better at engineering, but early on in 1865, um, there was a boiler explosion on a steam powered riverboat, right? Steam powered riverboats had steam boilers. It was an explosion. It was one of the first major U.S. disasters. 1865 was early on in steam power, um, and it killed over 1,000 people. So this is stuff that's, right, it has caused big, major um, types of industrial disasters having some of these things happen. Um, you can see, right, one of the things that we see from this is Thankfully, like the, the number of incidents has gone down in recent years. Part of that is because of um, retiring systems, um, retiring coal power plants and stuff, um, and replacing that with, with new systems. Um, I think a good question to ask, though, is um, what, what is the current state of the art? So if we go to, if my links work. So this power plant, the, let me make it a little bit bigger. Okay, the, the no. The John W. Turk Jr. power plant. This is the state of the art um, US power plant. The best coal power plant in the US the best coal power plant in the U.S. Um, and if we just look through here, um, right, let me get, uh, see if I can get a pen. How do I do that? Okay, I don't remember how to do that. But if we just look through here, so it's a 600 megawatt coal powered fire station. That's a really big one. Um, it's in Arkansas. You can see it has right here in the, the beginning of the Wikipedia article some stuff about um, it's the first ultra super critical coal plant. Um, what that means is, kind of as William said, like this is one that is actually, right, we've all drawn things on the phase diagram, like underneath the curve. This one actually, the top of it goes above that curve, um, which is kind of fun. We haven't talked too much about that, but it actually goes above that curve. Um, the pressure that it, the temperature that it uses is 600 degrees Celsius. So state of the art is kind of the ballpark that we've been solving problems at. Um, the pressure is above 4,500 PSI or 310 bar. That's 31 megapascals. So that's really high pressure, um, higher than the pressures that we've been dealing with. But that's, that's kind of where the state of the art is. Um, and if you look, Right, 
the construction was embroiled in regulatory roadblocks and environmental lawsuits, a total cost of $1.8 billion. It was the most expensive project in Arkansas history. Um, so functionally, why don't we build too many coal plants like that is because they're really, really expensive. Um, what do we get when we do? Okay, let's go down. Um, so 2015, um, Peabody Energy, the lowest um, lowest heat rate among U.S. coal-fired power plants. That means it's the most efficient. And if we were to do a little bit more digging, um, kind of beyond Wikipedia, we could see that the the efficiency of the John Turk power plant is about 39 to 40 percent. That's the thermal efficiency. So when we've gone through and kind of done our cycles, we've gotten for kind of real cycles, maybe something around 30%. Um, so you can modify it, like we talked about modifying, right, kind of the right-hand side of the temperature entropy diagram and the left-hand side, and we can do uh, kind of, you know, we can continue to raise the pressure, we can continue to raise the temperature a little bit, but we kind of get stuck right around 40%. Um, and it's really hard to go above that. Um, so, the question that, um, right, if we look at coal power plants, um, let's go back. No. Bear with me. Um, if we look at power plants, so that was a power plant in Arkansas. If we look at how, what's happening in um, here in Michigan, uh, so this is this little pie chart is what's where our power comes from in Michigan. Um, the red is coal, so about a third of Michigan's electricity. This is electricity. Uh, about a third of our electricity comes from coal. Um, that's actually been changing fairly quickly. About a third of it comes from natural gas, which again uses the same cycle the same pressures, that has the same limitations. Um, we have to still use 500, 600 degrees Celsius. We can't go too much above 20 or 30 megapascals. Um, we can't go too much above 40% efficiency. That's, we're kind of stuck in the same region. They, they operate exactly the same. They have a different heat source, um, nuclear fuel instead of coal, but it's the same. We get stuck in the same, in the same world for the same reasons. Um, natural gas is about 30%. And again, that's, um, that's also a fossil fuel power plant. Um, natural gas is the one that is a little bit different though. And I'll talk, we'll, we'll talk after the exam more about natural gas and, and why it's different. But if you look at coal power plants, this is something that I think is just kind of fun. Um, okay. So nuclear power stations tend to be really big. There are three of them in Michigan. Um, there are a number of different coal power stations in Michigan uh, of different sizes. So this is the, the list of all of the coal power plants in Michigan. Um, and one thing that you might find interesting, I find interesting, is if you read the notes next to all of them, you see a theme. Um, okay, the Bell River power plant in St. Clair, scheduled for closure in 2030. Um, the Ericsson power plant scheduled for closure before 2023. The Eckert power plant closure in 2020. Um, parts of it have already closed down. Basically, all of these different systems are are currently scheduled to shut down. So part of that is obviously the transition from um, coal tr transition away from coal is partly led by. Um, environmental concerns. But uh, the reason that every single one of these is closing is because of um, limits in efficiency and how how inexpensive you can make the energy. Um, so it's, it's mainly led, led by economics. If we go and look at former coal power plants, we actually find, oh, there's our one from Holland, the James D. Young power plant that closed a few years ago. Um, these decisions are, are mainly led by economics and at least in part led because um, the efficiency of these things caps out fairly low. 
um, which means that right if your efficiency goes up, your costs go down because you get more for the same kind of more bang for your buck. Um, all of these, especially the older plants, right? The the state of the art is 40 percent. The James D. Young plant um, was almost 100 years old when it closed. It was like 80 years old when it closed, and that had been gone on numerous modifications and was still under 30 percent efficient. Um, so a natural question is, okay, so all of these things are, right, coal kind of caps out and runs into a pretty hard efficiency ceiling, about 40%. Um, does anybody have any idea? You, you shouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to, but maybe somebody volunteered there or something. Does anybody have any idea what the thermal efficiency of Holland's power plant is? What would be your guess? Brand new, built in 2018. You probably didn't know this, but it's actually the most efficient power plant in North America, right here in Holland. Anybody have a guess what that efficiency is? So I just told you it's more than 40%, but what is it? 45 is a good guess. It's like 62%. So how do we get from 40 up to 62. All right, let's go back to um, go back to this. How do we get from 40 up to 62? There are two ways. A lower low temperature or a higher high temperature. Right? Those are the only two, those are the two ways. Those are the two games in town. Um, so a lower low temperature, that's kind of out of the question because that's set by the surroundings, right? We don't have control over that. So how do you get from 40 up to 62? You raise T high, you raise the high temperature. Uh, and the way that we do that is actually kind of creative. Uh, we use a, so we can't use a ranking cycle, right? We can't use this cycle that we've kind of been dealing with. We have to use a different one. And we use what's called, um, what's called the uh, Brayton cycle. Here, we'll pull up. Um, and we use one of these. So we'll go through after after the exam. I don't right. We only have like two minutes, but I want to at least show you this. Um, we're going to switch from using a steam cycle and steam turbines and a boiler and that kind of stuff. We're not going to totally lo lose it. Actually, we'll, we'll actually use a lot of that. But we're going to couple it with one of these, which um, you may see looks like a jet engine. It's the same components as a jet engine, but this is a natural gas turbine. This is one from GE. I think the, the ones in the, nat, in the Holland power plant um, are from Siemens, I believe, which is a German company. But there are a few different companies that make these natural gas turbines. Uh, if you go here, this is the, um, right, just kind of a, a sense of um, some of the, the the scale of some of these things. So I like this. It says here, um, you know, right by that, the hot air comes out of the speed approaching a category five hurricane. Um, and I think it goes and um, right, the, evac the exact efficiency. So this was the world record efficiency that they measured 62.22%. Um, the previous record holder was 61.5. And as I said, that's kind of where Holland's power plant is. How that actually happens is we use, um, and we'll get into this. I just want to show this is like a two minute video. Um, we take all of the stuff that we just did, we don't set it by the roadside. We actually, we still use Holland's power plant has a steam turbine operating on a modified ranking cycle. But they have that coupled with a natural gas turbine. 
So that's how you get from, um, again, this is Wikipedia, but that's how you get from 40 up to 60 is you take better advantage of your heat. Um, let me, okay, so uh, what's happening here on the kind of the bottom left, um, that's where we have our um, steam, or that's where we have our gas turbine. So we have a gas turbine, we hit play, um, our combustion turbine, it's operating there on the bottom left. We're burning natural gas. We're using what we call a Brayton cycle, which is a little bit like a ranking cycle, but a little bit different. It allows us to use higher temperatures. Um, so we burn our natural gas, that spins, we get power from that. But once that gas comes off of that turbine, it's still really, really hot. So we actually use that the waste heat from that first system as the heat source for a steam system. So instead of getting our, our tea hot directly from um, burning fossil fuels, we burn the fossil fuels, we use some of that energy, then we use the rest of it in a steam cycle. And in the Holland power plant, then we use the rest of it in a snowmelt system. So we actually have in the Holland plant, we have kind of three tiers where we try to get as use as much of that thermal energy as possible. We use the really hot, like the first bit in a gas turbine. We use the second bit in a steam turbine cycle. And then we use the last bit in a snowmelt system for downtown. And we actually use it a little bit for industrial, for um, heating the civic center and some stuff like that. Um, so you have to try to get kind of all of the ranges of temperatures and we have to do that in cr different and creative ways, largely because we have certain materials challenges, right? We can't just keep raising the temperature and pressure because things blow up. So we have to get more creative in how we're, um, how we're going to be able to use our hot temperature as hot as we can get it, um, but be able to use that kind of all the way through without suffering materials issues. So that's where we're headed a little bit. Um, after the exam, again, I mean, that's there's not going to be a combined cycle on the exam. Uh, but I just want to show you, kind of give you a sense of like all of this stuff that we're doing is is actually relevant to, right, the Holland Power Plant was built and, and started operation in 2018. Um, right, that's what, this is what is state of the art, despite the fact that this is also what was state of the art in 1860, um, which I think is a little bit crazy. But um, anyway, so that's all that I have for today. I'm going to hang around here if there are any specific um, questions on homework or exam material. Um, this past homework set, homework six, is going to be really important for the exam. Um, so make sure that you kind of have a firm grasp on that. I'll release the solutions to that soon so that you can work through and have solutions in hand. Um, and we'll try to get out we'll work in, and try to get that graded in the relatively near future so that you guys can see um, kind of your graded homework and see where you made mistakes. But I'll for sure be able to get the solutions released to that. So I'm gonna hang around. Um, you're welcome to hang around and join me or, um, right, I'll give, I guess, one last plug for the help sessions. There's a help session tonight. There's a help session Thursday night. Um, in the intro lab. So take advantage of those, especially this week. Um, take advantage of the study materials that are on Moodle and um, we'll see you next week for the exam.